I'm Technomancer. Uh, here's the Crossroads tutorial on the Technomancy machines. This video we're going to do the Technomancy machines that don't involve temporal entropy, and next video we're going to do the ones that do. If you're wondering how you make Cop Showium, that'll be in the video with the machines that use, tem that use or interact with temporal entropy. Uh, so without further ado, let's get going. So the first thing we're going to show off here is the Clockwork Beam Stabilizer. Actually, let me get both stabilizers. Now, the clockwork beam stabilizer is very similar to the normal quartz stabilizer we showed off before when we were talking about the beam stuff, uh, which is a non-technomancy feature. But just as a reminder, I'm going to show it as a, again. So what the, this stabilizer does is, let's say you're, you've got a bunch of pulsing beams, like some redstone. Let's say put some redstone in here. Uh, let's actually not use redstone because I'm really getting sick of lightning noises uh, from the charge beams. Let's use salt. <clears throat> and you've got a bunch of pulsing beams and you want a, a continuous output. Uh, the beam stabilizer stores up any beams it receives in like a buffer and just outputs constantly at its given power. Now this one I've just told it to output far faster than we can actually sustain, so let's go to a lower power here. Um, and you can see that this thing's sto got storage that's staying about st even, and uh, we're outputting a, con a more or less constant power that we set at power 16. Now, this is all well and good, but it has very small storage on how much you can store in total, and you have to manually set the output with a wrench. Uh, the clockwork version is the Technomancy uh, device. Um, sorry, my mouse cut out there for a moment. Um, and has a massive internal storage. Uh, the deep numbers are in the book, but basically you're not going to fill it. Um, and the output is not set with a wrench. If I shift right click with a wrench, it just rotates it. Um, instead, it outputs a, per, uh, a constant 20% of everything that come of, of what it's got stored. So why did I just use redstone? I just said I wasn't going to use redstone because it's loud. Now, as you can see, this means that we've got sort of a fluctuating output here because the amount stored is changing. If we were had a constant input, we're actually going to see a constant output uh, equal to what's coming in because that's the, the equilibrium point here. Uh, so if you've got a constant input, this thing acts just like a reflector, but you can see it's slowly draining out. If you've got a pulp, now what this is really excels at is if you've got either a pulsing or otherwise unsteady input, uh, but you don't really know what power it's going to be, and you want a constant output, you want to smooth out the fluctuations, but you don't need a constant power. Uh, now this is very good with combined with things like the beacon harness, which is a technomancy machine that will be covered next video. The next thing is the detailed auto crafter, which is again an upgraded version of something we've seen before. Uh, this is an upgraded version of the normal auto crafter from Essentials, which is the mod Crossroads relies on. Um, <clears throat> now, I'm not going to cover the auto crafter again. It's you can see it in the tutorial video for Essentials or in the book under Auto Crafter and Essentials. Uh, and the detailed auto crafter works almost exactly the same, except it can do recipes that are normally locked behind a path. So it can do detailed crafting recipes in addition to normal vanilla crafting table recipes. Uh, there, it looks almost exactly the same in the UI. There's this one extra slot. To do technomancy recipes, we need a technomancy sigil in that slot. And to do alchemy recipes, we need an alchemy sigil in that slot. The sigil isn't consumed or anything. It, it doesn't. You don't need to automate this or anything. You just put the thing in for the type of recipes you're doing, and it just works. Uh, it just needs to be in there. Um, this... Um, Prevents so if you this prevents you if you if let's say you've only unlocked technomancy this prevents you from doing alchemy recipes without someone who has unlocked re alchemy so they can make the sigil. Similarly, if there's any witchcraft recipes you wanted to make, you could put a witchcraft sigil in there. Now the next thing we're going to cover is a very, very important machine, which gets used a, a... Actually, no, let's do the lodestone stuff first. Sorry. So next up is two machines with very similar names that do sort of similar things. These are the lodestone turbine and the lodestone dynamo. 
Uh, they're quite expensive. The reason they're called lodestone is they have that in the recipe. Now, they do two different things. Uh, people often get them mixed up. You might want to check the tooltip if you think you've got them uh, mixed up in your mind. Um, the lodestone dynamo lets you convert forge energy into rotary power. This is the only thing in the mod that lets you make rotary power using forge energy. And you just use it like a normal dynamo in reverse. Uh, you give it FE on the side of the copper stuff and rotary power comes out the side of the axle. And it can make quite a lot of power. Quite a lot of power indeed. Now, the lodestone turbine is also a power source, a rotary power source, but it doesn't use FE, and it has some very, very unusual restrictions. It only works in certain dimensions, specifically dimensions where clocks and compasses don't work. So this is a vanilla mechanic. Uh, clocks and compasses, if I just put them in my hotbar, work normally in the overworld. But if you go to, let's say, the nether or the end, you'll see that they're acting all screwy. They're spinning around wild. Now, in any dimension where this is the case, so in vanilla, the end, or the nether, uh, but many modded dimensions do this as well, you can use the lodestone turbine. And it's just a free power source. It literally just produces power for free. No cost, no fuel. It doesn't produce very much. The machine itself is very expensive. Uh, it's actually... It's meant to be sort of a substitute for a windmill because you can't really use a windmill in the nether with what with the roof. Uh, also, I quite like the idea uh, just of because these clocks and compasses are spinning wildly, you should just be able to stick an axle to it and use it as a power source, which is how this thing is meant to work. It's basically just a compass with an axle strap to it. <laughs> um, now. If I built the exact same setup in the overworld, where there it was making free energy, in the overworld it will do absolutely nothing. As you can see here, where absolutely nothing is happening. Next up comes a very important machine, which is the Redstone Master Axis. Now, similarly to how in Alchemate we had the temperature regulator, if I go over here, all right, uh, do I not have it? Yes, I do which let us very easily control with very good pr high precision the exact temperature of a heat cable and sort of made everything we've done before to control the temperature sort of irrelevant and obsolete. Uh, the Redstone Master Axis does that for rotary speed. So with this machine, I mean, let me hook this up with normal gears. We use it instead of a normal Master Axis. So instead of using a normal master axis to control the system, we would use a redstone master axis. And then, we, this thing also needs a pass. So we, we hook up the gears on the front, on this side, as normal. And then on the back, there's this little X symbol. And this is the power source. And this, we need another gear attached for a separate gear system with its own master axis. So we've got two master axes here a normal one and a redstone one, and the normal one is being used for the gear system powering the redstone one. Now, if I cheat a little bit and get myself some 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 energy here, get this spinning, I can set give this thing a, a redstone signal or a circuit signal, let me get a circuit wrench, like this, and it will set the speed of the gears in the front to that circ to the to the speed equal to the circuit signal. So circuit signal 2.5, we've got a oops, that's a wrench. That's the wrong device entirely. Uh, we've got a, a speed of 2.5 radians a second. Now this isn't free. If I were to detach the power source at the back, you'll see that suddenly it's not holding steady at 2.5 and power loss is happening as normal. Um, Similarly, if I were to add energy to the front that would bring it above 2.5, it'll hold it steady at 2.5 and send the extra energy to the back. Um, and now this is going quite fast because I've dumped quite a lot of power into this. Now if we set this to a value much faster than we can actually sustain, like 25 radians a second, there is not enough energy in this whole system to spin this at 25 radians a second. It's going as fast as it can up to the limit. Uh, but it's just not able to reach 25. That's just too fast to sustain. 
See, it drains all the power, this stops, and this is going as fast as it can because it just can't reach 25. Now I can show you here that if I just start playing with this number, you can see in the UI, in the world behind this UI, you can see the two gear systems that as I turn it up, energy moves to the left, and as I turn it down, energy moves to the right. So you can get some quite dramatic changes here. And this is a very useful device, uh, thing because it just lets us control speed so precisely. We can also put a negative value in here to spin the opposite direction. This is also where we're going to introduce Kopshoyam gears. Now, the Kopshoyam, you may recall, is that material which gets used in a lot of technomancy recipes. Uh, you can use it to make gears and axles and whatnot, like, like it were iron or copper. Um, and the interesting thing about Kopshoyam gears is if we look at their mass, their I value, sorry, you'll recall normal gears had an I value usually in the hundreds, and that was their momentum, their, not mo their momentum, their, their mass, basically, how heavy they are, how resistant they are to spinning. And the, the, changing, in, the changing speed, their inertia, if you will, and the I value of Kopshoyam gears is zero. Not 0 0.0001 or something like that, zero. What this basically means is that spinning them takes no energy at all. If I right click at this, you can see the energy in this gear is zero even though it's got a speed. If I detach the power source, we're fine. We don't need any power if we're only spinning Kopshoyam gears. This is very useful. I can spin these things really, really fast and it doesn't take any power because they're massless. Now the moment I add a normal gear into the mix, this thing has mass, that means it needs a power source. <laughs> now, before you think about how you're going to run all your millstones and whatnot off of massless gears for free, uh, no such luck, because most machines like millstones have their own I value. So you will see, still need an energy source. <laughs> uh, you also can't have a gear network with only massless gears. It just doesn't work. Like, I can have a normal gear network, like, okay, so Redstone Master Axis, you can have purely massless gears if you want. If it's a normal Master Axis, you can't. This is a normal Master Axis, it's not letting me, it's not spinning. Uh, this is because there's no nothing to set what the speed should be. Uh, you could say it's a divide by zero thing, and it's like infinite speed, but it just doesn't spin. Adding even one normal gear, and it'll work fine with the normal gears setting the pace. Um, but now I can add as many cop showium gears as I want without slowing it down. All right. So we're going to be using redstone master axes quite a bit. And the, uh, but before we do, we're going to show off one last normal machine here before we get to the really cool stuff. And that machine is the sequencer. I have fallen in a hole. That is fine. Now the sequencer is a purely redstone machine. This It doesn't interact with gears or the world or anything other, else like that. It literally is just a thing that does circuit stuff. So we're going to, oops, what did I just do? I need that. Okay. So let me just connect some circuits up to it. As you can see, we can connect circuits to it. And let's just show that number so we can see a number. <clears throat> now, if we look in this UI, because this machine does have a UI, we see a lot, of a, a lot of lines where we can type stuff in. We can type in numbers, and we can type in equations, just like it was a constant circuit. And we can also scroll. So if we scroll down, we can go all the way to line 99 if we want. Um, and we can put things in any line we like, as long as it's, you know, a number or an equation. An expression, actually. Now, you'll see these line numbers are lighting up with colors. Um, and you'll see that the one is currently red, a bunch of these are yellow, and the rest are gray, like normal. Any line with a number in it will be yellow or red, and any line that's between two lines with numbers in them will also be yellow. And those lines default to zero. So line four here, which has nothing in it, 
is defaulting to zero. It's exactly the same as if I did this. Now, if I hit tab while I've got a line selected, it makes that line number red and unredifies the previous line, the other lines. Now, the question here is what on earth am I actually doing? Well, if I select line two, which has a value of 3,344, we will see that this thing is outputting a circuit signal of 3,344. If I select the line with, oh, uh, negative 4.2, uh, output of negative 4.2. So the line with the red number is the circuit signal currently being outputted. Now, every time this thing gets a strong redstone signal, and for people who aren't that great with vanilla redstone, Strong redstone signals come when you have a repeater or a compare, like usually a repeater pointed directly into it. So you need a repeater usually as an input. Every time this thing gets a, wrong, a strong redstone signal, it's going to advance in the sequence by one step. So we, we have line three selected, and now we have line four, and now line five, and you can see that the output there is changing. And when we reach the end, when we reach line six, which has a negative 4.2 in it, see negative 4.2, when I give it a redstone signal again, it's gonna loop back to one, which is the first line one, which is the first thing in the sequence as it's done. And in case that wasn't uh, clear enough what's going on, I'm now going to make so that every line has its line number as the value, just so it's extra clear what's going on. So now we've got line one selected, we've got signal strength of one, Line two, we have a signal strength of three. Line three, we have a signal strength of three, and so on. And then when we reach six, the last line with anything in it, we're gonna loop back to one. But we could put any values in here we like. I've seen people use this for all sorts of things. Uh, someone came to me with, a, with a, an idea to make to use it to play Never Gonna Give You Up on Note Blocks, to give you an idea of how this can be used. Uh, it's just a redstone component, nothing special. Uh, we're going to be, but there's certain technomancy things where it can be quite handy to use that in conjunction with it. And that segues us, the redstone master axis and the sequencer, into this machine, which is the beam cannon. Now, the beam cannon is this thing. This thing here. Now let me place one down new so you can see one in its uh, natural state. You can place them on walls. You can place them on the floor, and of course, you can place them on the ceiling. And they don't need a solid support, so I can just break this. And if I disconnect all the inputs here, let's get this nice and clean. We've currently got one that's pointing straight this way, yes? Now I'm going to put some beams in it. If you, this thing accepts beams from any side, so let's just shoot them in from this side, and let's put in uh, what's going to be something obvious that not too destructive. Normally I'd use lightning, but that's under a roof. Oh, I know. Uh, we'll use we'll we'll use. You know how I just said let's what's something obvious but not too destructive. We're going to use something destructive. What's the point if you don't get to blow stuff up? I ask you. Hold on, let me just build this. All right, we're going to shoot void stability beams at this thing. Now, as a reminder, void stability beams explode. So it should be pretty obvious. So we're going to shoot... Now, this thing's going to act right now pretty much like a reflector. So it's pointing that way. We should expect beam shot into it to go that way. But reflectors, reminder, normally only go around 16 blocks. This is going to go quite a bit further. Now I've put an obsidian down just so that it doesn't tunnel through. And you can see it's uh, exploding. As you'd expect, uh, it's exploding. And you can see the range is much further. In fact, it's 256 blocks, not 16. So you can hit things quite a ways away. The other thing is, if we shoot out of a beam cannon, we can collide with enemies. So I'm standing in the way and it's hitting me now. Normally, things that come out of a reflector just ignore enemies completely. Not so when we're with that cannon. So be careful in standing in front of it. This is quite loud. Now the other thing here is that this still does let us, like, take the beam out again. So if I... 
were to go up here and just put a reflector down, like it can go back in, oh I just hit something, oh that's not important, it can go back into a reflector, or similar machine. Oh look, nothing important exploded, good, good. Now, it wouldn't be all that interesting if it was just a reflector that only could, that can get with a longer range that can hit entities. I mean, I guess that would be kind of useful, but no, we're, we, we're, we've got other things we want to do with this. Now, pretty obviously, it shoots the beam out of the direction this giant metal tip is pointing, yes? That should be clear. Now, give me a moment to make a few adjustments. Okay, and the adjustments I've made is I've reconnected these two, uh, these two systems here, these two gear connections. Now, if we take a closer look at the actual beam cannon, just in the world, now let's put it on the wall somewhere, uh, do... There's an axle connection on the back, and there's an axle connection on all the sides. This thing actually has two rotary inputs, um, so you connect to one of them through the back, and the other through any of these four sides, it doesn't matter which one. And these two rotary inputs let us angle this thing. I also want to note that this thing has an I value of zero. That means with, if we can spin it with just cop showing him gears and, and, with, and not need enter, any energy with our Redstone Master Axis. Now, if I set this one going into the side input, if I set it to say 0.3, you can see that this thing has now gone at an angle. And now, actually let's make that angle a little steeper, 0.4, sure. And now if we send a beam in, it gets fired out of that angle and blasts a hole straight through that giant dirt mountain. Okay, I hope you're starting to understand what this thing is for. So, if we now, now this side input will adjust what's called the what is called the the um, pitch uh, so the pitch is this angle here up e down e so the speed of the gear is going to be the the pitch so if the speed is 0.4 radians a second the pitch aka the angle off from going just straight is 0.4 radians as a reminder this is just a thing in math uh, pi over 2 radians, aka right around 1.5 radians, is a 90 degree angle. So at 1.5, we should expect this thing to be going more or less straight up. A little bit less, because it should actually be pi over 2. So if we put in pi over 2, and it, as you can see, it goes straight up. Uh, if we go pi over 3, we should see a nice 60 degree angle, and so on. Now, if that was the pitch, let's go a little something, a little, something a little less extreme. This is the yaw control. The speed in the back is the yaw. Now, the yaw is the rotation of this whole thing. So if we look, it's currently pointed straight up. And now if I give it, let's say, pi over 2, aka 90 degrees, it's just spun around 90 degrees and is now pointing that away. And now, let's say I want 1.8 spinning a little more. So I can use the two speed inputs, which we can just use a redstone master axis and make it into basically two circuit inputs to point it pretty much any direction we want and just hit anything we want. So from right here, we can hit pretty much anything within 256 blocks. None too shabby. None too shabby at all. So if we want to hit, let's say that, let's say that little ball there, like that sphere of dirt that's a bit to the left. Uh, that should be around negative 0.3 approximately, and this should be a bit higher, let's say 0.7. That looks right. Yeah, that looks right. That should be a, that should be a direct hit on that dirt ball there. Let's do it. Oh, am I good or what? Okay, there we go. Now, of course, you can use these things for stuff other than 
exploding rays. Uh, although that's a pretty good use. I mean, giant, honestly, a giant laser that you can use to excavate a huge area and, I don't know, do mining, that you can just reorient with a redstone. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good way to clear out a huge amount of space. You could use it with, let's say, void stability beams and try and use it to basic as a turret to defend your base from mobs. Uh, you could use it to heal you and you come in the front door. I don't know. Whatever you want. You can put scent, shoot any beam with this. Um, and it's it's just very useful. It's got its, it's some good uses. Now... This I mentioned that I mentioned the sequencer earlier because if you wanted to use the same cannon to hit the, a bunch of different targets, let's say I wanted to say, oh, I want to hit that, and then I want to hit that, and then I want to hit that, and then I want to hit that again, and then I want to hit it that again, and that again, and that again, and that again, and that again, yada yada yada. You could have all the different angles programmed in a sequencer into sequencers, and then just go between them in order. So that's actually a machine that's new, and the latest update. Alright. That covers everything, all the items in Technomancy in the previous video, and all the blocks in Technomancy that don't involve temporal entropy in this video. Next video, which should be the last one, we're going to cover all the blocks in Technomancy that involve the temporal entropy mechanic. Uh, which is this really menacing looking black laser thing in front of me. We'll get there. That's next video. Alright, see you then.